Okay, are we good? Okay, so we're getting signals that we're good. We're getting started. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the uh, National Refuse Fascism webinar. Um, we got a good program planned for you. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about it, um, what we have planned for what we expect to be about an hour long program, and then I'm going to hand it over to Coco Das to get started. Um, welcome from around the country. We have about uh, 13 mass meetings happening today. So people are gonna be watching this together. We wanna welcome you, you're in the right place. If you are tuning in live or later around the country on your own in any capacity, this is gonna be a really important, um, this is a very important movement. We're glad that you're with us and we got a lot to get into and, and work to undertake for the people of the world. We're going to have an intro um, from Coco Das of the editorial board. Everybody you're gonna hear from today is a member of the refusefascism.org national editorial board. We're gonna start with Coco Das, uh, giving us some orientation and situating the moment that we're in, um, followed by Rafael Caderas, who's gonna talk a little bit more about the post impeachment moment and the particularity of the period that we're in. Um, you need to silence the echo chamber in the room. Here we go. Um, after that, I'm gonna speak a little bit and sum up the work of the last six months that we've been undertaking, the struggle to drive out the Trump-Pence regime, to launch the Out Now movement. And this will transition into explaining to you a lot of what we as the editorial board have been wrestling with and the plans that we have for going forward, which Sarah Rourke will be uh, unfolding for people. And then we'll share more from there. Andy Z will comment a little bit at the end. We'll bring him on the camera at that point. So, you know, all together we expect to take about an hour, um, maybe a little bit less. And without anything more, I want to hand it over to Coco. All right. Can you all hear me? Is my sound good? Uh, okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. So um, I wanted to start by welcoming everyone, whether you've been around since um, the early days of refuse fascism, or if you're brand new, just finding out about this, you're, you're right to be here. And I'm really happy to be here with you. And uh, we're at a crucial juncture. So um, it's very important that that everyone is here. And what I want to start by saying is that from whatever background or perspective if you that you're coming from, if you know that the Trump-Pence regime poses a, a catastrophic danger to humanity and the planet, and that they must go at the soonest possible time, and that you need to act to make that happen, then you belong here. Um, if you've been around for a while, if you were in the November 4th, 2017 actions, you were right then and your actions mattered. Uh, imagine what the landscape would be like today if refused fascism had never come out on the scene to challenge the legitimacy of this regime and set people's sights on driving them out at the soonest possible time when everything on the landscape was saying that we have to accept this because this is a regime that was elected into power. You know, imagine if there had not been a force out on the scene recognizing that this was fascism, which a lot of people have caught up with now. But this analysis from before the inauguration was necessary and you know things have changed, the, the, the world has changed and we have continued to, to, to look at reality and confront reality in order to, to stay on this mission, which is the, the entire future of humanity and the planet is actually relying on this, on us, the millions of people who do not want a fascist America actually standing up and, and taking unprecedented action. So our founding mission was that the election or our founding analysis was that the election of Trump and Pence was a leap in fascism and it had to be driven out at the soonest possible time through a different kind of protest, sustained nonviolent mass protests, starting with thousands, leading to millions of people in the streets saying no, refusing to accept a fascist America. And this has not happened yet, but the need for it and the basis for it is still there. Um, 
only this movement from below can dislodge a regime that is at the head of the most powerful country in the world. Um, we need a force that is an equal or greater force against the millions of people who are part of this fascist movement. And you'll, you know, we're going to be talking more about that. We said back in 2017 or 2016, really, that the normal channels nor the Democratic Party could be relied on to stop this. And all of that has been borne out to be true. And that this fascism would advance in stages with periods of normalization. That has been borne out to be true. Now, uh, if we think about what could have been prevented if more people had come out and come around to the understanding that this was fascism and it was up to us to drive it out, um, think of what could have been prevented. Concentration camps at the border where tens of thousands of immigrants are being tortured and it's going to get worse. Millions of Muslims banned from the um, traveling to and from this country. ICE terror, the courts being stacked with fascists, including the Supreme Court. Now the reason the millions didn't come out is not mainly due to our shortcomings. Other forces came out onto the scene with a message of driving out elements of this fascist program, calling for mass protest. But the fact is that no one was able to solve this problem and people as a whole were not as outraged or motivated to act over the last two years as they were at the first Women's March where three million people came out. But that doesn't mean that our founding mission was wrong. It is even more correct today than it was then. So now more than ever, we really need to bring people back to this core principle that was the beginning of our founding call, which is this slogan. In the name of humanity, we refuse to accept a fascist America. And I'm gonna talk through that a little bit so that we really can pick this apart and understand why it's so important. Um, so why in the name of humanity? because the, the consequences of this are for all of humanity. It's not just a threat to America or American democracy, Americans. It is a threat to the whole world, all of its people, 7 billion and even other life on this planet, the very existence of, of, of life on this planet. Um, and no other force can actually be relied on to fight for the interests of humanity. Uh, there, we just witnessed an impeachment where people at the top were you know, fighting something out that was important. But even there, those forces are there and their job is to fight for the interests of Americans and for their, the interests of, of America and American power, uh, for the interests of the system. That's their job. But all of us, the millions of us who hate this, who do not want this future, we are the ones who actually can and must fight for the interests of all humanity. The whole world is counting on this, us to do this. Um, fascism disguises itself as the will of the people and it narrow, narrowly defines who is human. And we have to reject that completely by saying that what we're doing, we're going forward, opposing this with everything we've got in the name of humanity, because this is, our interests are the interests of humanity, a world um, where, you know, our girls don't have to grow up to be the property of the state and of the church, a world where, you know, the planet can actually sustain life and, and you know, we can, we can thrive. Um, that is our interests. Um, so that is why it's important that we we expand and we really push and challenge people to expand their sights that this is not for us alone, this is for all of humanity. And then I think it's worth defining who is the we in the name of humanity, we refuse to accept a fascist America. Look, there's no savior coming from up high. This has been shown to be true over the last three years. Um, you know, people have waited, people have waited for Mueller, for Nancy Pelosi, and, and uh, things develop, things change, but in the end, that savior uh, from up high is not what is going to resolve this crisis. It's going to take the millions of us um, 
a mass movement from below, standing up for our own interests, which are the interests of humanity. Um, it is the people, the people around the world who have been rising up in the streets, driving out hated regimes. Even the most entrenched uh, dictatorial regimes cannot withstand a political crisis of people in the streets day in, day out. Um, so that is the we. It's the millions of us down here who have the interests of humanity at heart. And then the next part of the statement, we refuse to accept. Now think about what was said right after the elections and has been drummed into people's heads over and over, really over decades now, but you know, certainly um, over the last three years, that we have to accept a fascist regime because it was elected. And if you don't like it, then all you can do is vote them out. And the logic of this is actually putting the future of our children and grandchildren, the future, the, the taking away um, a guarantee that there even will be future generations. Um, it is at a time when the planet is burning, we're at a critical time in, in human history. To accept this, to accept a science denying, climate denying, um, re genocidal regime is, is actually accepting that the world could end and we have nothing that we can do about it. Um, this is absurd and this is, to refuse to accept it, there's a lot packed into that, but the very first thing we have to do is refuse to accept that. No election, fair or foul, can legitimize a fascist regime. This was also in the founding call. Now, millions of people vote for immigrants to be thrown into concentration camps. That only means that millions of us who do not want that, who have a conscience, who still have some of their our humanity, um, have to act on, act in opposition to that. Um, first by refusing to accept it and then by acting. Otherwise we're complicit. That's what's meant when people say, don't be a good German. You know, the majority of German people did not agree with Hitler. Certainly not on everything. Certainly they did not, probably did not want people slaughtered in their name, but they accepted it by not opposing it in the way that it should have been opposed. So refusing to accept it is, is a very positive, uh, a, a very positive thing to say. And then the last part is a fascist America. And we should start here with the America part because people don't really understand the, the stakes of this. Right now, there is one superpower in the world and we live in it. Uh, it has the most powerful military in the world. It has a disproportionate influence on everything that happens globally. You know, what, what happens here affects somebody in Nigeria, affects somebody in, 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 in India. You know, it affects somebody in a, a little island in the Pacific. So what happens here actually can determine what happens to the future of humanity and the planet. And we have to confront that. We have to confront that, that power. We have a fascist regime with its finger on the nuclear trigger. And it is not unimportant that this is the only country in the world that has actually dropped nuclear weapons. Um, but a fascist America, a, a fascist America is not just a pendulum swing, as awful as that can be, but is a, it is a radical remaking of government and society for generations to come. This is what they have stated that they want with a regime a hateful, uh, just heinous regime controlling the military, controlling the executive branch, and now essentially the judiciary and the legislature. The, the separation of powers has been eviscerated. Now, why did Trump say, I have the police, the military, and bikers for Trump on my side? Um, because that's true. <laughs> and this is a regime that now has the, the, its hands on the levers of power, and it also has a base. It has a base of, of people 
where the worst is coming out, the worst in society is coming out. Um, and then there's a whole change in the way that this system is being governed. Fascism rules by organized repression and terror by the government. Civil liberties are stripped away, law rewritten, dissent criminalized, the courts packed with fascists, and the separation of powers and church and state ultimately eviscerated. This is what is happening now. As part of radically remaking society, the Trump-Pence regime must sharply attack those in positions of power who oppose them. This is what is happening now. And fascism mobilizes mobs of vicious thugs as we've seen with Nazis marching and murdering in Charlottesville Virginia, and, and recently in Virginia. Um, uh, in, a, in a different form, which was much more normalized and legitimized. So a fascist America is a nightmare for Americans. It's a nightmare for people here who are living within its border. It's a nightmare for immigrants who are trying to cross over because their countries have been destroyed. But it is a nightmare that the whole world is, is going to feel and is feeling now. So I'm gonna say the statement again. In the name of humanity, we refuse to accept a fascist America. This is the spirit and understanding that we need to take on the biggest challenge of our lives right now. This, this regime is the most dangerous regime in, in the world. And the future, you know, it is really not an exaggeration to say that the future of humanity depends on what we do now. For everything positive that we want for the future, this is a message that needs to get out. So I want to say again that you, we were right, we are right, and we are assessing the situation now. And that's why it's really important that everybody um, has come together for this webinar. So I'm going to uh, turn it over back to Sansara. Oh, thank you, Coco. That was that was really important, very powerful. We were cheering over here while you were speaking. So I'm going to give it to Raphael. He's going to talk a little bit about the moment that we're in now post impeachment. So go ahead. Um, yeah, that was really moving, Coco. And, um, you know, I think, you know, all this, everything you said about in the name of humanity and who who this is for and rejecting all the us and them that really is escalated and paving the way for genocide and you know the danger of this regime for the whole planet um and it, you know the, the everything that's happened in the last few weeks has really under underscored you know the points that you're, the general points that you're making about what's happened over the last three years but it's all really escalated and you know in particular in the aftermath of well through the course of this um impeachment trial as you mentioned where you know not only was trump not found not held accountable for breaking, you know, for breaking the law, for abusing his power, for obstructing Congress. But, um, you know, the arguments in the course of the trial, you know, particularly Dershowitz as Trump's lawyer, Dershowitz's argument that Trump can basically do whatever he wants, including stealing elections if he says it's in the public interest. Um, you know, they, they basically have elevated him and set a legal precedent. Um, you know, elevating him above uh, above the law, and basically declaring that he has the right to do what whatever he wants. Um, as I said, including stealing elections, which has something to do with whether you know we can really rely on these elections to stop this fascism, and we'll talk more about that. Um, but you know, the other thing that happened through the course of this trial is that refuse fascism was out there in front of the Capitol um, almost every day. There were some others from around the country that came out. Um, if you're watching, hi. Um, hi to the people in the DC chapter of Refuse Fascism that are watching right now. I think they're having their meeting now. Um, but way too many people uh, stayed at home. And this was, you know, really um, frustrating and infuri infuriating um, because this actually was a moment when the removal of Trump actually was on the agenda and had people actually flooded into DC, had people flooded into the Capitol, it did have the potential to change the equation in the Senate, you know, and, you know, at least get a situation going where some of these Republican senators maybe could have voted to have witnesses and evidence. Um, and then from there, who knows what could happen. Instead, 
these Republican senators were able to get away with a, a rigged trial pres presided over by the swing justice on the Supreme Court. And people basically, you know, through their passivity, through not coming out in the streets, through not demanding that there be a fair trial, you know, in a way that was not just on social media, but out in the streets, they actually, you know, also helped to acquit Trump in a certain sense. And, um, you know, and meanwhile, these, these fascists were really on, you know, they were mobilized. We saw this, um, Coco mentioned in Virginia, there was a, a rally of 20,000 armed fascists, you know, in the midst of this, um, you know, fighting for so-called guns rights, but it was really a, a white supremacist rally backed by Donald Trump. Um, and then there was 100,000 people that literally marched right through DC in the midst of this impeachment trial, the, the Walk for Life, which is really a walk for forced motherhood, um, you know, trying to take away women's rights to abortion. Also, again, Donald Trump spoke at this, the first sitting president to do this. And there, there were other things in the Kentucky, in Kentucky, uh, Nazis marching in DC right after we left. So these fascists are really mobilized. Donald Trump has like repeatedly had huge rallies even since this acquittal in New Hampshire and other places, um, Phoenix, all this. And, you know, it, it is the case as, as Coco was saying that the, the worst are filled with passionate intensity while the best lack all conviction. Um, you know, and then since since this whole acquittal, the other major development is that Trump has gone on a rampage of revenge against his his so-called enemies, against you know pur you know purging people who you know testified against him, who did what they're actually supposed to do, which is comply with the subpoenas and come into court and testify, kicking them out of of the White House, literally marching them out, like this uh, Vinman guy and his brother who testified against Trump. Um, you know, and, and on top of that, um, you know, there's been escalations of threats against Adam Schiff, against Nancy Pelosi. Trump said Pelosi tearing up the, the State of the Union speech was a criminal offense and had crowds of people chanting lock her up about Nancy Pelosi. Um, you know, and there's been an escalation of his actual fascist attacks on immigrants, um, you know, on the environment. We've seen the Muslim ban now be included, being included to add six more countries, including Nigeria, and now a third of a quarter of people in the entire continent of Africa are banned from coming to the U.S. Um, you know, this 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 is an escalation of ethnic clean, cleansing that's happening, and meanwhile, you know, uh, we're being told to just. Uh, change the subject, you know, to just focus on elections, literally the elections that j Trump just got caught trying to manipulate, trying to sabotage. Um, and what are the Democrats saying about all this? They're pretty much almost completely silent about what's been happening over this last period. And, I mean, at the, at the last debate, the Democrats didn't even, you know, didn't even hardly mention Trump, and they have refused to call him out for what he is, which is a fascist. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the elections and what we need to do going forward. But um, I just thought that, you know, everything that's happened over this recent period really does speak once again to the importance of uh, refuse fascism, of this analysis that this is fascism and how it's actually taking a leap right now. And you know, it is, in, it is in a very negative trajectory and we should recognize that at the same time, you know, there, is, there, is, there are ways in which people are, begin, are sounding the alarm, are beginning to confront this. So we have to build on that going forward. All right. Well, thank you, Raphael. Um, I'm just going to turn the, yeah, <laughs> the uh, computer a little bit. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to share a little bit of um, on the editorial board over the last, well, all the time, we are wrestling like we expect and, and hope that all of you are too with what we're facing, um, how to understand it, and how to act on it to, in, the, in the name of humanity to refuse to accept a fascist America. And we have been persevering in our understanding that the only way to redress this danger of a fascist America, which is advancing, as Coco put it from, we saw this very early and as Raphael was just speaking to, it's taken an enormous leap through the acquittal of Donald Trump through this sham trial that 
the only way to redress this fascism, which is advancing, is through a mass movement of people from below in sustained nonviolent political protest. That sustained meaning coming back again and again, like we've seen around the world, until you create such a political crisis that you compel the removal of the fascist regime. So over the last six months, we actually really threw in, and people watching, you were part of this. Some of you, we met through the course of this, and you're tuning in as part of this. And if you weren't part of it, we want to share with you some of the thinking that we did throughout this, why we launched the Out Now movement, an attempt that we began last October to, to, to launch this sustained protest to demand Trump Pence out now, and through the whole period of impeachment, and how we sum that up. Um, we actually sent a letter to the organizers on February 15th, which I want to refer back to. It's a really good letter that sums up some of this experience. And I'll only be able to touch on it a little bit. But we want to share with you the thinking and our assessment that informed this and the lessons that we're drawing from it. Um, obviously, it's apparent we did not succeed in driving out the regime. Yet it was really, we feel very strongly that it was correct for us to have tried to do so and to launch that struggle and to not give up on that. Um, and in a few minutes, we'll talk about how we see going forward to fight for that in, in a different way, but with the same goal in this next period. Um, so last October, we launched the Out Now movement. And we did this towards the end of the summer. I just wanna say, share with you a little bit why we assessed the, the basis to do this and the need to do this. We sensed that there was a shift well, there was several things. It was the fascism of this regime was advancing. And we saw this with the mass shootings of Latinos in Gilroy, California, in El Paso, in Texas. Um, we saw this in the revelations that came out that even after uh, massive outrage, international outrage and massive protests and lawsuits and legal um, uh, injunctions against child separation, apparently, you know, it had been going on and escalating across the country. The re revelations came out um, that children were being separated and caged on a massive scale. This and other indicators that, that the fascism of this regime was marching ahead and needed to be stopped. <laughs> Two, flowing from these outrages, there actually was a shift and an upsetting, unsettling of a lot of the normalization that had settled in on people. And there was a renewed, there weren't mass protests, but there was a renewed sense that this was really intolerable and something needed to be done. One of the things that helped us understand this is I, myself and others who were part of the Get Organized for an Actual Revolution tour who were in Chicago after the El Paso shooting, we went um, and took over Lakeshore Drive in protest, raising the banner of revolution and standing with immigrants and Trump Pence out now. And, and people flooded into the streets with us off the street, tourists and, and locals. And, it, and it, it was one of many indicators that there was some sentiment for this. There was sentiment also being expressed in social media for mass protests. There was other people who organized um, protests that, that were calling for impeachment and removal of the regime and not waiting for the elections. The We the People, um, or yeah, We the People did a protest. Um, there were different indications coming together of a mood shift. Um, and there was protests all over the world becoming undeniable, helping people imagine acting outside the normal channels. And the last factor that, that I wanted to highlight is we were, there was a certain playing out of the reliance on normal channels. People had tried the midterm elections and it didn't slow this agenda. People had waited for Mueller, it didn't slow this agenda, it didn't stop Trump. They had tried a lot of this and there was becoming increasing frustration that the Democrats weren't gonna impeach they were, they were ruling it off the table at that point. Obviously that changed, but there was an increased sense of potential frustration that maybe we need to act ourselves. And we thought these were positive reasons to try to, do, to launch a struggle from below. And at the same time, we recognized if we didn't go for it, the longer we waited, the more the logic of the primaries and the elections would take hold and draw people in as the main form of political action. So we launched, an out now movement calling on lots of people from different perspectives beyond refuse fascism to take up the single unifying demand Trump Pence out now and to go into the streets and try to kick off this sustained protest from below. And we began in October in New York and Los Angeles, Cornell West, Andy Z, Carl Dix, Sharon Salam, different people came together, hundreds of people came together in our kickoff protests 
And then we spread around the country for the next four weeks in over a, do in a dozen cities and did sustained protest. And through this, we actually did put the demand on the map among a certain section of society. Not throughout all of society, but among a certain section of people and it mattered. Trump, Pence, out now. We modeled the kind of ongoing sustained protest that is necessary. And we attracted and built and forged new people into this organization. We strengthened the organization of refused fascism that has got the mission and the understanding to drive out this regime, who are attracted to being for real about that kind of sustained protest and calling this what it is, fascism. It's how we met a lot of the people who I hope are tuned in today and at these meetings today. And it's very important. At the same time, we did not succeed. And that's the main thing. I mean, actually both are very important. We did not succeed in getting the kind of geometric growth. We never, the protests kind of maintained, but they never got beyond four or 500 people nationwide. Oh, I should mention very importantly, in Los Angeles, our very first protest was viciously attacked by mega Nazi white supremacist thugs who came out and violently attacked it. And people came back in the face of that very strongly and were not intimidated. And this was very important. And I think these fascists understood the potential of what we were onto as well. We never got the growth that we were aiming for, but we did accomplish some things. And then as this was happening, um, the impeachment actually began to break and to develop. And it became, wasn't determined yet, but it became clear that things were moving in that direction. And we felt we had to bring to bear what we had forged. And this opening of a real fight at the top, including then Trump was impeached, and this mattered, it's historic, it's a big deal, that this had to be pushed on with the trial about to happen in the Senate to be pushed on this question of Trump's removal. And so we, we really worked on that. And we did that around the country. I'm gonna abbreviate some of the elements of this and, and fast forward to DC because we don't have as much time and, and some of this is spoken to in the, in the letter, but we came to DC, Raphael was talking about this. We mobilized volunteers from around the country to come to DC and, and lead protests. And we met people in DC who are at the Senate trial hearings who are demanding the removal of this regime and calling on people to enter this equation from below. And had there been people responding in a bigger way, things might have unfolded differently. He spoke to that. Um, and there's reasons that they didn't. And the main thing that I wanna draw from this or the main things I think we should understand is in looking at this in falling short in getting that kind of geometric growth and, 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 and push from below to, to pry open what was going on in the impeachment. We do not feel that falling short is because of errors on our part. We actually are very, very convinced, we wrestled with this on the editorial board, that it was correct for us to have pushed for this all the way through October through the impeachment, and that we were mainly right. We were right to do what we did, and whatever mistakes we make, we made, everybody makes mistakes, they weren't the reason we fell short. Principally, people in this country have been very stubborn. <laughs> about seeing the need themselves to act. And they've been very reliant on the official channels. And that when the impeachment opened up, there was renewed sense that maybe somebody else is gonna take care of this for them. And there was also the fact that the impeachment was on narrow terms that were important, uh, that had to do with the rule of law being destroyed, the, the truth being destroyed. It, they were important issues, but they also weren't the questions of the Muslim ban or the immigrants in cages. They weren't things that people saw as easily their own interests bound up with. And so there was a tendency of huge to, to remain passive in the face of this. And we will highlight that no group was able to pull out big numbers in this period. The women's marches, which have been very big over the years, we're very small this year. This is, there was a mood. It was not us that didn't, weren't able to mobilize people. It was nobody was able to mobilize people in this period. It was still very important what we did. And it's still very important that we persevere. But we felt and that through this, it wouldn't make sense to continue to try to do the week by week out now protests that weren't growing and to think that we were gonna break open a dynamic that we hadn't broken out yet, that we had to persevere but we have to go at it a little bit differently. And this is where um, coming back from DC and the changed conditions with the impeachment acquittal and the vengeance, terror of vengeance that Trump is on right now, 
there's greater danger and need to drive out the regime, there's also some new openings to show people how seriously fascist there is. There's a little bit, it's more apparent to more people. And so this leads to, and I'm gonna hand it over to Sarah Rourke, um, also from the editorial board to talk about the new statement of conscience and why we, how we came to the idea of, of putting out a new statement of conscience and what role this needs to play. Um, Sarah, if you're there. I'm hoping Sarah comes online soon. Um, and, you know, so we made plans to persevere. I see motion in her icon. Here we go. Um, something went funny. Oh, there she is. Okay, so Sarah, I'm going to turn it over to you about the, um, the how we see going forward in these changed conditions. Right. Well, um, so I'm going to try not to uh, go over too much of, of the, the points that have been covered already, um, which I was ready to, to go over if they weren't. But uh, you guys actually hit a lot of um, really, really crucial points already. Um, one thing I would like to, to do to frame us is that you have to understand that we are not carrying this organization in sort of the way that Americans have gotten used to, unfortunately, um, having things sold to them. Let's put it that way. Uh, there's sort of a thing in our culture that, you know, you, you fake it till you make it, everything's a brand. Uh, and so basically, the model is usually pretend success, even when you don't have success, spin it, you know, uh, make up things if you have to, you know, always, always signal strength, never ever admit to mistakes or weaknesses or, or, or things that still need to be done, rah, rah, rah. So if you are on the mailing list for any of the electoral volunteering, the campaigns uh, or non-governmental organizations, you're probably familiar with this because it's every single fundraising email you've ever gotten that, you know, hey, look at, look at this thing that we achieved. Um, and kind of glossing over what wasn't achieved and what that meant. So we, what we wanted to do on the editorial board is practice this uh, virtue of transparency and with you guys as well. We recognize that we don't have the answers for, all, for everything. Nobody has the answers for everything. This is a very unique historical moment uh, for our country. And there are a lot of people who are pretending that they have the answers. Um, but if you notice, they don't answer or change the subject when they are asked, what are we supposed to do with Trump cheating in the election that you're telling us we need to win? How, how do we win? if he's getting away with rigging it right before our eyes, if he just got acquitted for rigging the election and there's now new reports uh, that, that he's getting more foreign interference in our elections. You know, uh, our, as a Democrat, I don't like to say this, but our leaders are tending to pretend those things are not there. And when they're asked about it, they, 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 they shift over. Um, pay attention to interviews that they're in and you'll see that that's uh, the case. They don't have the answer to the question, what, what if he doesn't concede? Um, and part of that is because of their nature, they're legislators, we send them to Congress to legislate. Of course they believe in the system that we sent them to be part of. Um, so they don't wanna talk about a solution outside of it. Uh, that's not their home ground, that's not where, what they're on. But we don't have to be constrained by their job requirements. We are the people and we have, con we have human rights to free speech, to nonviolent protests, to uh, chart our, our country's course and how it behaves in the world and how it treats our fellow human beings and how we're treating our fellow human beings. Those are rights that we have no matter what form of government we're under. Um, so again, we don't need to make heroes of Nancy Pelosi or any of the, the candidates in the democratic field. They're flawed human beings. Some of them are great. 
some of them aren't, but they don't know the answers. It's just their job to pretend that they do. In Refuse Fascism, we are wrestling with ourselves all the time and wrestling with the people that we meet, um, encouraging vigorous debate, encouraging always to start from a basis of reality. And you know what that means is that your, 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 your messaging isn't always going to be as slick and perfect because you have to acknowledge what has happened. What has happened is that the terrain has changed, the clock has moved closer to midnight, the situation is objectively worse, and our time is running out. We, we can't, we can't uh, sell a, a fantasy that everything's going to be okay with us just going about our normal business. That's, that's just simply not true. Um, there are others who want to sell us that fantasy because they want, they want our, our uh, they want our cooperation. They don't want to panic. They're afraid of, they're actually afraid of what the people in masses will do because what the people in masses can do is powerful. Um, and nonviolent protest has a history of re removing oppressive regimes um, that, that they know about. Um, okay, so why this specific statement right now? Again, like I said, since we're proceeding from a basis of reality, we are acknowledging that there's been a shift in the terrain. The impeachment was a mile marker, and it was a test um, that the country failed, frankly, um, which was, are we going to allow this? Are we going to allow this blatant violation of the rule of law where he is extorting a foreign nation to get dirt on his political opponent in the election we're supposed to be waiting for. And he was acquitted. Not only was he acquitted, but as the others have said, the crowds, not just for our rallies, but for many other groups' rallies, uh, were not at the numbers that, that we would have hoped for and, and certainly not at the numbers that we require, still require in order to reach the tipping point where this becomes a situation that the powers that be cannot ignore and must address. And the other organizations know that as well, by the way, if you, uh, you know, talk to them over, over coffee or tea or whatever, um, and they will acknowledge that they are struggling with these same issues. Um, again, they also are brands, so they're not gonna put that in the fundraising letter, but it is the, it is the truth that we are at a very dire moment um, and they don't have all the answers either. We have to find the answers together. There, there are answers, we can find them, but there's no one single hero uh, or genius or guru who's going to get us there. We have to make an active participation process and we all have to bring what we see in our lives to it. Um, and that is, how, that is how it has been done in other countries like in South Korea 2016, and that is how it will be done. Um, this statement marks a new phase, post-impeachment phase, that reflects the fact that this test was, was failed by the country. And what does that mean and where does that leave us? And most importantly, what can we yet do? Is it too late? Our analysis is that it's not too late yet, but this was a significant step towards the con consolidation of fascism. And there is such a thing as a point too late. Um, at one point, Hitler could have been stopped with, uh, with fairly small effort. He was a nobody. Um, there was another point at which he could have been dealt with diplomatically if the other nations had stood together against him and not con conciliated. And then at a certain point, that time was passed. So you can have too late. And we are determined not to wait that long. We are sounding the alarm in this call because the alarm should still be going and it should still be going even louder than before. Um, 
it's also resetting the terms. What we found from talking to people uh, about why they don't come out into the streets is that they honestly don't remember that this is an option for them. Um, and media coverage uh, and the, our political system try to encourage that, try to uh, not remind people that there is an option uh, outside of the normal channels that is that is moral, that is our human right, and that is effective. Um, and it's it's a, a little funny that that is is the case. Um, we need to send a message to the world. There's a you know I've I've spoken to people from abroad who basically don't think there is a resistance to Trump because it's not robust as they expected it to be. Um, and they think that means that we don't care, that, that we're all right. We're just going to go along with this. Um, we've accepted fascism till November. We've accepted fascism indefinitely. We have to send the other message that, that we are Is here. That, we, yeah. I'm interjecting because we have to, um, we have to move forward because we got to give time for the chapter. So if there's anything, I'm sorry to interrupt. Is there anything you want to say specifically about the statement before we have Coco read it? Like yeah. A minute, one or two minutes. Let me, just really quick, let me just really quickly uh, go through the things that this letter can accomplish. Um, basically, we need to be, we need to have a foundation laid. Even when we don't have protests going constantly, we want to have the foundation mentally. We want uh, we want our principles to keep coming back to, especially as fascism consolidates and it's easy to lose your humanity in those. Um, we will be using this call to recruit volunteers to explain the situation to people who don't get it yet, don't get that this is fascism, don't get that um, that there is a possible option for nonviolent protests to remove this regime. Um, and uh, also to, uh, did I say mass recruiting? Mass recruiting, volunteer recruiting, and also reaching fig figures of influence who are some of the voices with disproportionate power that can help put us over the threshold. There's a tipping point threshold we have to reach. Um, and that is, that is the purpose of this letter structurally. But the reason that, it, it, that we actually revisited the content is because the situation has really changed um, and where this has the potential to go has changed as well. So yeah, uh, I invite you to look at the look at the call and um, and look at actually look at look at what has changed. And we also have lots of material up on the on the website with the specifics of that, um, reflecting on the protests, reflecting on recent events and the acquittal. So um, put those together with the letter. Uh, and you'll get a, a complete picture of our analysis, our thinking, and why we're choosing to go forward with this call at this time. Thank you, Sarah. So um, I am uh, there. I think that there's been a lot of provocative, um, a lot to chew on with uh, what Sarah said and uh, Rothens and Sarah before that. But now I would like to read this call, which is a draft call. Um, it's it's very close to its final version, but we understand that there there may be um, some things um, that will change. Um, and this is something that we would like you to discuss too, and and um, write back to us with your feedback. Um, so this is the new draft call, or statement of conscience is actually a, a more accurate way to describe it. Silent no more, we say the hour is late. For three years, the Trump-Pence regime has brought an unrelenting barrage of insult, injury, and atrocity with catastrophic consequences for all humanity. 
There are times in history when a people must reach deep into their collective conscience and act with unprecedented moral courage to stop the crimes of their government. Concentration camps on the border, Muslims banned, environmental devastation accelerated, war, even nuclear war threatened, fascist mobs and racist mass murders, truth and science erased, the right to abortion near gone, the rule of law and democratic and civil rights stripped away. We must say out loud what has been too often spoken in whispers and riddles. An American fascism is here and advancing, wrapped in the flag and Mike Pence's Bible taken literally, spreading its poison of white supremacy, misogyny, xenophobia, and oppressive fundamentalist traditional values. The world as we have known it is being torn asunder. Thousands fill stadiums and cheer as Trump spews heinous bigoted rhetoric at his Nuremberg rallies. His acolytes threaten civil war and carry out acts of terror and violence. Trump's acquittal in a sham impeachment trial has set a legal precedent for him to do whatever he wants, even steal an election, as he barrels ahead with alarming vengeance. The regime bludgeons the very notion of objective truth, trafficking not merely in lies, but in flagrant campaigns of disinformation. They purge those who refuse to march in lockstep, then pack the judiciary, the police and the military, the executive and legislative branches and the state houses with fascists and all manner of reactionary zealots, including theocratic Christian fascists who see this as their last chance to cement their domination for a generation to come. The damage already done cannot be easily reversed, while worse is surely to come. History has shown that fascism must be stopped before it becomes too late. It might only take a single serious crisis, international or domestic, for this regime to drop the hammer irrevocably. Enough. We raise our voices here to say, in the name of humanity, we refuse to accept a fascist America. The hour is late. The atomic clock that measures the danger of nuclear war and planetary climate destruction has been reset to 100 seconds before midnight. Every day that this regime remains in power endangers the very ability of our planet to sustain life. No longer can we stand aside while this regime shreds environmental protections, bans Muslims, cages immigrants and terrorizes people in other countries with threats of fire and fury and the destructive force of the most powerful military in the world. We will not allow LGBTQ people to be sent back into the closet and women to lose the right to abortion and birth control. No more moving the goalpost of what we will tolerate while we retreat into our private lives. We recognize that if we do not intervene now, we cannot ask how the German people accepted the horrors of the Nazi regime. What we allow is not just what we condone, it is what we become. The hour is late and it is long past time we cast aside illusions and self-delusion. For over three years, people have waited for the blue wave, for Mueller, for impeachment hoping that every misstep, every obstacle, every leak will lead to his downfall. But the normal channels turned into dead ends as the regime shredded the norms and changed the rules. Nor can the Democratic Party stop this nightmare. Trump has branded them as enemies, hurling words like traitor, rallying crowds to lock them up. The Democrats have advocated for and actually worked with Trump when he would let them when they finally moved to impeach, it was on the real but narrow grounds of, of cheating on elections, but not the core crimes of the Trump-Pence program. They have not called forth the one force that could change the whole political equation, the power of the people in the streets. And they refuse to say publicly what many of them know in private, that Trump is a fascist. Let us not hope against facts that the 2020 election, the same election that Trump was on trial for sabotaging, is enough to resolve this crisis. 
What will we do if Trump wins or loses and refuses to step down? What damage will the fascist forces he has unleashed continue to inflict, even if he does lose and leaves vengeful? No election, fair or fraudulent, can legitimize what has been normalized over the last three years. If we can accept a fascist regime until November, we are accepting fascism. The hour is late, but we can look to the people around the world who have taken to the streets and sustained nonviolent mass protests to drive out hated regimes and win a chance to shape their own destinies. The eyes of the world are on us now. They want to see whose side we are on. Will we capitulate to this regime with our silence, passivity, or willful blindness? Or will we act, resisting every injustice of this regime and going all the way to actually knocking it off its collision course with humanity? There is a way to stop this with a different kind of protest. Imagine tens of thousands growing to millions in the streets in nonviolent sustained protest demanding Trump and Pence out now, staying in the streets week after week until our demand is met. Our actions would reflect our love for humanity in stark contrast to the hate and bigotry of the Trump-Pence fascist regime and create a serious political crisis for the ruling powers leading to a situation where this illegitimate regime is removed from power. We must act to make this real. The hour is late, but it is not yet too late. We pledge that we will not stand aside while there's still a chance to stop a regime that imperils humanity and the earth itself. We come from different perspectives, but united in our determination, we say, in the name of humanity, we refuse to accept a fascist America. This nightmare must end. The Trump-Pence regime must go. All right, well, thank you, Coco. Um, that, as she just said, that's a draft of a statement that we are gonna um, finalize very shortly and release to the world. And, and we do want, for the meetings that are about to begin, um, we would really like people to discuss the content of that, have a little bit of refinement, but discuss the content of that. And for the next eight weeks to 12 weeks, we are going to make this the centerpiece of the work that we're doing. We want to take this out broadly throughout society, get thousands or tens of thousands of people to, to read it, to grapple with what's in it, and to add their name, to sign this. High school students, college students, intellectuals, artists, uh, people in the neighborhoods, people of all people who are most directly under fire and people who are not signing this and, and, and actually making a collective commitment to its content as a, the main way of organizing people into this movement. Two, we're fundraising with it. When people sign it, they should give money. We should ask people to donate generously and everybody to jo donate something. We want to actually build up a financial war chest to be able to wield this statement through ads, through different ways that we're going to need to intervene as we go forward. So this statement is the glue of organizing and consolidating our chapters, expanding in this period, and um, fundraising for the future. And the heart of your meetings that should happen now, right after we hear a few words from Andy and one last announcement from me, is how are we going to take this out in the world and build around it? And then we will be responding to major developments and events, um, outrages that need protest. We will be responding to them and mobilizing at key junctures, but with this statement and building towards the mission described in the statement. So that's what I wanted to say. I'm gonna give it to Andy Z to make a few closing comments. Hi, okay, so briefly, the, um, this, we've had four call, what we called calls to action from refused fascism. But when we were confronting the situation that fascism has taken a major leap in, what's the matter, Deborah? It's okay. Um, uh, the fascism has taken a major leap uh, with the uh, end of the impeachment of, of Donald Trump and the uh, uh, vengeful uh, consolidation of this that he's going through. We realize that there can't actually be a, a, a call that any call to action now has to step back to what it is that we're facing. 
And so it actually becomes a, a, a statement of conscience. And any statement of conscience against fascism requires action or you're acquiescing to that fascism. So that's why we are doing this over the next two to three months, going out to people and making the case for what it is they, they face. Because it's true that we didn't succeed and that it's also true that we weren't wrong. It's also true that nobody has stopped this course to date and that many people are relying on uh, hoping against hope for the elections actually, hoping against facts actually. So that in returning to this slogan, in the name of humanity, we refuse to accept a fascist America. And going deeply into that, we can bring to people why it is that fascism could happen in a country like this. And I do recommend that people listen carefully to the opening of this uh, broadcast uh, in your meetings, what Coco Das said about the slogan, in the name of humanity, we refuse to accept a fascist America. And part of why people haven't been able to see the necessity to act is because they have refused to believe because they've been trained to think in a way that America can only be a force for good. And not wanting to confront that a country founded on slavery and genocide and that has continued this discrimination against people and as Coco said, dropped two atom bombs, that a country like this could go to uh, a fascist state a full out fascism. So these are things that people need to confront and that there is no painless progress. These are the kinds of things that we need to get into with people so that we are preparing people to think differently about what they're facing and on that basis to actually act differently. So um, with that, uh, you know, I think this is a big thing we ask people to do this fall and we made some progress, but people looked at it and saw the abyss that it would mean in the kind of struggle Yes, we called for nonviolent mass struggle and civil disobedience and all that, but that sustained struggle is a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. When you're facing 22,000 people with guns saying they're prepared to go to a civil war, that does give people pause. But up against what is actually being done by this regime, that's a cost that we have to pay. And yes, we will keep this movement to be a nonviolent mass protest movement for the single unifying demand of the Trump-Pence regime must go. But we do have to accelerate that and take out this statement of conscience as a way to preparing people to act consistent with the needs of humanity and in the future of not only humanity, but the planet and all the species on it. So with that, I hope people have a good meeting, get going the, uh, on, on this new work and raising the funds so that we can at some point in the future, undefined when that would be, lead millions to get out into the street. And, um, and to go forward from there, there will be a final draft of this soon. There are changes that I, all of us on the Ed Board wanna make, but I think you can discuss this statement as it is today and get a sense of what it is that we're calling on people to do. So uh, that's, that's it from me. Um, but I do think millions of people need to sign this ultimately. And to be clear, when we say discuss this, we're asking you to wrangle with its content and take it out as a working draft. If it, not take it out yet, we'll finalize it, but discuss it as a working draft, its content. Um, we're not asking everybody's editorial suggestions. We are nearly done with that. We'll be publishing it very soon. I did want to, before you have your meeting, I want to let you know in Los Angeles, there are two members of the LA9, people who got arrested over two years ago, trying to bring forward the mass protest that had we succeeded, the world would be in a much better place right now. They're facing three years in jail. They already went through one trial and got the charges dropped, or the, the, it was a mistrial. Nine out of 12 jurors were voting to acquit, and it was a mistrial, and the city of Los Angeles is prosecuting them again. They could go to trial as early as Thursday this week, two of the LA9. I mainly want to encourage everybody to be watching the refusefascism.org website for everything that goes up there, um, including an excellent piece, a lot of excellent pieces, but also for this case, we're going to need people to mobilize around the country. But I know you got to get to your meeting, so I want to I want to close out and thank you for tuning in. Thank you, Coco and Andy and Raphael and Sarah. Thank you. Thank you, and have a great meeting, and let us know how it goes. We're going to be going forward together.